it's important for the health of women Mm -hmm. to learn divorce. And I say that because if, what is the percentage of marriages that end in divorce? It's like this ridiculous astronomical number. Yeah, is it like 70, 80% now? It's crazy. Right, so if the majority of marriages end in divorce, not only should we learn to communicate in the marriage, but we should also as women learn to call a divorce when it needs to be called and then be present in the divorce and be civil to your divorced husband. Like we need to practice this. Yeah. We can't pretend that the fantasy is that we will always live happily ever after. By listening to my guests share how they are discovering their best self, you will discover the best part of you. And welcome back to Discover Your Best Self podcast. You all, I'm really excited because today I have with me author and chair of Human Rights Campaign Foundation Board, Ms. Jody Patterson. Um, I ended up meeting her through Instagram. Y'all know me. I'm always looking for someone fabulous to get on the show because um, we want to learn from them, right? And so today I think that she has an awesome story to share with us just about you know, her, um, you know, journey, personal, professional journey. Um, And so no further ado, I want her to go ahead and introduce herself. So tell us, you know, who you are and where you're from. Hi, I am Jody Patterson. Um, I'm definitely a native New Yorker. Like a native (laughs) New Yorker. Um, But my, my, my roots, I guess, are Southern as well. So my mom's from the South and my dad's from Harlem, New York. And I really feel like I'm a combination of the two things. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And um, I'm a mom of five kids. Some of them aren't kids anymore, but to <laughs> me, they'll always be my babies. Um, as Toni Morrison says, what is grown to a mother? <laughs> yeah, I love Toni Morrison. <laughs> you know, she always nails it. So I have five, five people that I'm raising from 12 years old all the way up to 29 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have always been a writer. In fact, I graduated from Spelman College with um, um, studying literature. Okay. So I've always enjoyed writing and reading. And then over the five years ago, or what's it five? Several years ago, I can't keep the time. <laughs> I wrote a book of my own first book, which is a memoir um, oh. about my experience with my kid. How was that process writing that book, getting into it? I have a friend right now writing a book and she's just like, some days she's in it and some days it's like, I got to get a chapter out or a couple pages. Yeah, it's, um, it was, it was cathartic. I mean, it helped me process a lot. You know, I was, I was looking at, um, my life. So I'm trying to, trying to close my, my, um, computer off as we speak. So I don't get beeping and buzzing my kids. Oh, no problem. It's my my children and my mom trying to reach me at all times. <laughs> um, but so yeah, I, I wanted to really, I wanted to share with an audience how I moved through gender and rediscovering rediscovering gender and re, un, relearning gender. Oh, okay. Share with an audience how I um, began to understand my son who's trans in a way I had never understood him before. Mm-hmm. I wanted to share with an audience how as a black woman with real strong roots in the South and in the church and in family was able to shift my mind. Mm -hmm. Because for me, I didn't grow up understanding transgender realities. I didn't didn't grow up understanding that even gender was flexible. (laughs) I just thought, man, woman, we may never understand each other in their story. But so I had to, I wanted to share with people the process of, shifting your mind yeah it is and so that was the book it was great to write it I still read it I I reread my own book that's (laughs) not you know just to to remind myself what I've learned Mm -hmm. that's interesting I didn't know that about you so discovering that about your your own um, child you know what was that emotion how did that feel at first I thought I had failed to raise a proud girl Mm-hmm. You know, my, my, when, when my um, child was born, I assumed girl, mm-hmm. the doctor said girl, I looked at the body and I said girl. Mm-hmm. And so I was raising this person as a girl. And although I don't really believe, you know, I know like intellectually, we don't, we shouldn't raise our children fundamentally different boy or girl. When I look back on it, there's a lot of bias there. 
mm-hmm. you know, speak to my sons in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking to my girls, you know, mm-hmm. a little different to them. I was letting the boys kind of get tough on the basketball court, fall down, scrape a knee, literally and also proverbially and get back up. And my girls, in the girls I was sort of raising in a, in a different way, a little more protected. Um, and I now that I think back on it, there's a lot of, you know, protection we give certain children. Mm-hmm. Um, and then more leeway that we give other children. So at first I thought I'd failed to raise a proud, strong girl. Mm-hmm. And when Pinnell said to me, mama, I'm not a girl, I'm a boy. I felt guilty. I felt um, that I had dropped the ball on, on my lineage because we have a lot of strong women in our family, mm-hmm. a lot of strong activists, civil rights leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- so I tried to then go double down into my beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, but that just made my kid not want to live. Right. What's the point of that, right? Doubling right, down right. on your belief if it produces non-life. Yeah. Yeah. So then I just realized that what I was thinking was my own thoughts and what Pinnell was telling me was his reality and I had to meet him at his reality. And so um, I got out of the guilt, I got out of the shame and I just started learning and reading about yeah. the history of gender, yeah. the history of trans folk. And really I went back into the history of black uh, resistance and black um, fight because the gender revolution in many ways is very similar to um, the civil rights revolution because whenever you have an inequality or a bias or a prejudice, just look back at how (laughs) black folks have done it. Yeah. Hit it on decades and decades and decades that we have dealt with prejudice and bias and inequality. And so I just went back to my roots to figure out how to um, approach Mm -hmm. my bias around gender. Yeah, that's super interesting and thought provoking and emotional. It's all of those things all at once. Um, you know, for you to put that into a life experience, did that help you with um, working or with other people and just becoming more of an active listener to who people yeah. were? Yeah, right. Because it's not just, okay, what don't I know about? the transgender experience, it then becomes, what don't I know in the world? Mm-hmm. If I didn't know that my child was a boy, mm-hmm. there's a, probably a lot of things in this world I don't know. I mean, I'm a very hands-on mom. I always, in fact, probably a little too much as, as far as my kids are concerned. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I know, I know how they breathe. I know how they eat, you know? And so not to know my own child was mm-hmm. a devastating blow. But then I realized there's probably a lot of things in this world I don't know. And I took it as yeah. a challenge. Right. Malcolm, another, another author that I love is Malcolm Gladwell. And he says, in order to be an expert, you need to devote 10,000 hours mm. something into learning it. So I just dove into gender and got into that. And I, it, it allowed me to, um, even as an adult, mm-hmm. even as a seasoned adult, know that there are things I need to learn. Yeah. So now I'm on this like quest to learn all the stuff I had not known. I yeah, not. I love that. And that's really the premise of, you know, discover your best self, which is learning people and their stories. And, you know, through that, I think we learn ourselves because it, it makes us become introspective and look and see like, okay, well, what is it, you know, that this person did that maybe I should do, or I didn't do, or maybe I've been doing those things and it's wrong or something. I don't know. But, you know, it seems like you have such a, a transitional journey and you know when you first started out in your professional career what did that look like I'm sure it didn't look like what it looks like today well I'll tell you I mean well my everything has changed Mm -hmm. literally everything has changed so when I started lifting up the rocks and when I started you know looking at myself and also asking what who who haven't you become who are you hiding within yourself? You know, because mm-hmm. I was definitely wanting my son to be authentic. We use that word a lot. I was like, yeah, you tell the world who you are. I'm with you 100%. But then I wasn't doing that. So how can right. a, a toddler be asked? <laughs> mama's not doing. So really, I, I became much more um, bold and um, authentic and 
uh, you know, explore, explorative mm -hmm. in my own life. Um, it, it, it led me to new careers. Yeah. Right. I became the chair of our largest um, LGBT organizations foundation board. Oh, wow. And I've, I've never sat on a national board before. I've never been responsible for millions of dollars. <laughs> I've never been the boss of the boss of so many smart people. But in this process of um, understanding my kids and understanding myself, the potential became limitless for me. Yeah. How do you get into a position like that without having the experience? <laughs> because you have life experience. Okay. You have perspective experience. So typically you would have board experience. Um, here comes my dog. <laughs> you would have board experience. Typically you would have experience, um, fiduciary like knowledge, like how to, you know, best manage tens of millions of dollars. Um, but, and, and those things, are, and, and, and typically you would have um, institutional knowledge of an organization, like have been with the organization for years, if not decades. Mm -hmm. Those things are really valuable. Mm -hmm. but, and what I brought to the table was just as valuable. So there's, um, you know, even within the LGBT community, the trans, tr understanding transgender folks and realities and needs um, has not been at the, at the forefront. Mm -hmm. when I as a mom I'm not going to stop <laughs> until you understand what my son is going through and what he needs so I brought right. experience on on you know being a transgender family being a black queer family I brought experience with the understanding that you don't have to know to be in the beginning but you can mm -hmm. you yeah. can know you can learn so those things I had to understand is valuable it took some you know time because you walk into a room which I do as a black woman I'm always walking into rooms because that's what I was told to do. Just mm -hmm. go in the room, get in there. Yeah. So that was not a problem, but it was more like, you know, I just had to experience the board for a bit, see what the gaps were. This is really important. You know, being bold does not mean just shooting from the hip and like, mm -hmm. you know, you have to see what, what the gaps are. So I sat, I was on the board for a while. I saw some of the gaps, some of the spaces where there was not enough understanding. I, I um, thought about it for a minute mm -hmm. and then I realized what I have can fill some of those gaps. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't bother me to not have all of the experiences, but I had some of the experiences and I had an ability to close gaps and, that, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. Are these gaps closable? Can you help close the gaps? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And black women, black women, we have a lot of these um, skill sets that can help the world close the gaps. Why is that though? I, I feel like I know why, because I'm a black woman, but for people who are listening, why do you, because you're a strong advocate and um, I think highly opinionated, which is good. I like it. <laughs> it depends on who you are, if you like it or not, but I like it, you know, and, and I feel like it, um, it's very, uh, what's well, always going to be, um, you know, at the forefront, I think. Yeah. So why do you feel like that? Well, I mean, I think <clears throat> there's studies around it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's real, there's real data. I usually don't speak from the data perspective, but because honestly, you can give people all the data in the world and they still won't believe you when it comes to Black women, Black men, yeah. people of color. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll just say that there is scientific, there's data around what, what is called post-traumatic growth. So how some people and communities grow, they learn from trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and so you'll see black folks learning from trauma. That's how we built our HBCUs, mm -hmm. our black colleges and universities. That's how we built our churches. Mm -hmm. That's how we built our communities like Tulsa. That's how we built and educated people within the family. We experienced trauma and we learned more tenacity. We learned more faith. We learned more language of the other cultures we learned more compassion mm. these are things that have been seen through time and it's called post-traumatic growth so the interesting thing is that not everybody has growth after trauma some people don't so why black folks i don't know but <laughs> <laughs> it's something you know, innately in us we we have we've, we have an, a tenacity and an experience with trauma that has given us a lot of wisdom 
um, and we have not necessarily, uh, you know, written a book about it, or we haven't read the books that have been written about it. We just have been doing it. And so what I like to do these days is to actually stop and name what has been done in the Black community mm -hmm. as knowledge and as post-traumatic growth, as um, skill sets that can help close gaps, as um, a mothering practice that has been like sort of nurturing entire communities. Mm -hmm. And Black I like when you talk about the mothering aspect, you, you know, you um, described it as anyone can kind of have that, right? Yeah. And, you know, explain it. I don't know if people have heard, you know, what you, what you talked about, but explain it. Thank you for noticing that. I, I've been talking a lot about motherless, gen, uh, genderless mothering. I've been talking a lot about genderless mothering. And that to me um, is something that I think will help close gaps mm -hmm. and um, help us sort of shift from the bad state of affairs that the globe is, uh, is in to something much more healthy. So I think that mothering in the way that I'm speaking about it is leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, I think of it as, you know, building, intentionally building a person up or intentionally building a community up or even intentionally building up an idea. Mm -hmm. But it's like the leadership and how um, that leader can help grow a person or a community or an idea. And so I've seen some of the best mothering with a capital M done in the queer community. Mm -hmm. I started looking at that, like how are young people mothering other young people? Mm -hmm. How are brothers mothering siblings and it's working? How are gay uncles mothering? How are trans folk mothering? I, I'm watching it happen. And I started to think, why is some of the best leadership in the family, biological family or chosen family, mm -hmm. done not just with, with cisgender women, but with people who care? Mm -hmm. So I think that mothering can be done I use the word mothering, right? It's, I codify. I like. I like being a mom. I codified it. Yeah. With all my experiences, so I just call this mothering. Yeah. I'm not talking about like, um, all the tasks that yeah. I'm told as a woman. So there's there's one thing like you know who's making the beds, who's remembering the calendars for the schools, who's doing the grocery shopping. That's something mm -hmm. important. What I'm talking about is leadership that builds people and communities. That can be done by anyone. The nurturing aspect. Yeah, and not nurturing, not, like, I don't necessarily mean, like, soft hugs and kisses. Yeah. I mean growth. Mm -hmm. Who's growing this family? Who is growing this community? Mm -hmm. And that means you need to be thinking about activism. You need to be thinking about um, tenacity. You need to be thinking about sustainability. You need to be thinking about the economics, collaborative work. These are things that we have thought about in terms of, like, City planning, for example, you think, you know, those things are important in city planning, but, but mothers are growing little cities at home. Yeah. Little communities of diverse people. Mm -hmm. So hugs and kisses, one thing, but I'm talking about the growth and the stability of communities. And I call that mothering because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I get I like to the words. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, walk us through, you know, you said that you, you know, served on a board and then um, you've been an author. And one of the things that I really like that you said was, you know, we're starfish. You can always, you know, get cut off and do something else. And I, I really like that analogy because, or that metaphor, um, because I think sometimes we get stuck and we mm -hmm. think that, that that's it. Like, oh, well, I've already tried to do this or, you know, this is too big or, or whatever it is, and then people just kind of stop trying. So Starfish was was the first, I started thinking about literally Starfish. Yeah. Decades ago, one of my favorite um, musicians was singing about Starfish. And I thought, it stuck in my mind for some reason. I started thinking about them and studying them. And, you know, they so they if, if, a, if a limb is cut off, they regenerate, they grow back. There really is no boy or girl Starfish. They mm -hmm. just starfish. They don't do the boy thing or the girl thing. They just <laughs> stretch out and touch the sand and go this way and then go that way. If there's trauma, it grows back. So it was a major theme in my life. It still is. It was a major theme in my book. 
Um, and it is now a theme in my family. I tell my children to starfish, mm-hmm. you know, and I tell myself to start, and I actually tattooed it on my hand. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> I mean, you know, you just have to, as an off, as a writer, I like to play with words and words do something to my um, energy. So when I say starfish, Jody, it means don't just think of yourself as a 51 year old mother. Don't ask yourself, well, what would a mother, what is a mother supposed to do? Yeah. You know, what is a lady? What does that mean? I don't, I, I don't. <laughs> what is, because I'm a mother, I can't do a, what does that mean? Yes, Who says that? Right. So people will tell you, my children, even people who love you will tell you. Yeah. Don't do that mama. Yeah. Or don't do that, Jody. That's not, that doesn't look right. That's not what the, that doesn't fit the brand. Yeah. Um, and so only I can brand myself. Yeah. To what feels right in my heart and, and my spirit. And sometimes that's a momentary thing. So I know that I'll tell you something that mothers aren't supposed to do. They're not supposed to go off grid. They're supposed to be um, where people can find them. <laughs> no, I don't want you to find me something. Exactly. <laughs> this was accountable at all times, findable at all times, um, and all knowing of the data of the house. Like, who about the, so? Do the dads have like, their list? Yeah, right. Because so, no, this world is not set up that way where women and men and moms and dads share in the leaning in process. And so, I think it is radical when women, particularly moms, can't be found might be for a day might be for an hour but that's what I do when I starfish I actually I go you might not you know you you won't know where I am yeah and it's people think it might be irresponsible to not so I have backup there there's a dad there are aunties so they're not unsafe exactly so I there's a safety net, net that's there and then I go off grid I might be writing a book I might be with my boyfriend. I might be um, doing some really bad yoga. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I think that's really what I want to do. <laughs> the bad yoga is important. Like not everything has to be top notch. Sometimes it I doesn't. Downward dog, like, you know. Is <laughs> you know, it's because I want to do it. And, and I wanted to ask you, and I hope it's not too personal, but you mentioned, you know, you've been married and divorced a couple of times and, you know, <laughs> and so I've been divorced as well. And so I feel like I was stuck in a, uh, like you, like how you were just saying when I'm not supposed to do this or not supposed to do that. And did any of that play into you evolving and saying like you wanted to move, move, move on? I think that's a thing that, that moms are not supposed to do. And women, we're not supposed to leave men. Yeah. And, and people will say, well, he was a good man. Yeah. Why would you even consider that's crazy, Jody? Why would you leave? And I'm not, it's not just me. I think women aren't supposed to leave men. Um, wives aren't supposed to leave husbands. Mm-hmm. Mothers aren't supposed to leave fathers. Um, and in, in that fairy tale, you know, the, the woman is always the martyr. Mm-hmm. And so I just believe that it's, it, it's, I left my relationships after many, many years. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, I just, I'm flipping in and out of, I'm not flipping flipping men, right? Like some people flip houses. I was not flipping men, but I, I spent lots of time within those relationships, deep loves, like I deeply in love with Mm -hmm. and then as we progressed those relationships no longer served me Mm -hmm. and they no longer serve those men Mm -hmm. my grandmother says sometimes you have to call it like it is Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cannot cry over the the relationship or the lost job there's so many out there so if the relationship isn't serving the two people yeah just just, you know call it you can gracefully leave Mm -hmm. and then uh so we are still in a sense chosen family i mean we live a few blocks away Mm -hmm. we're in constant contact um we don't go to dinner yeah (laughs) together (laughs) but we can civilly raise our children together yeah Mm -hmm. so you know i think it was like um to to divorce is something we don't talk about but i think there's a way to, to divorce you know we can we can disagree with decorum so we can divorce with decorum 
Mm -hmm. Um, We can co-raise our children, Mm -hmm. co-parent. And it's important for the health of women Mm -hmm. to learn divorce. And I say that because if... What is the percentage of marriages that end in divorce? It's like this ridiculous astronomical number. Yeah, is it like 70, 80% now? It's crazy. Right, so if the majority of marriages end in divorce, not only should we learn to communicate in the marriage, but we should also, as women, learn to call a divorce when it needs to be called and then be present in the divorce and be civil to your divorced husband. Like, we need to practice this. Yeah. We can't pretend that the fantasy is that we will always live happily ever after. It's just not, in this in this. Content. And it's, I feel like we have to know what our happiness is for ourselves. And that might change, right? Yeah. In years to, because I think as we get more, as we evolve more, and as we start to really self-analyze, we will shift. <laughs> it's just a fact. Yeah. So people have always shifted, but in the past um, cultures, it wasn't appreciated. So you just kept your shift to yourself. Mm. And maybe, you know, it's closeted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was me for the LGBT. I think people have lived a closeted, closeted life in terms of their inner yes. desires, their inner thoughts and their inner shifts. And so now we're saying people shift. It's okay to shift. Well, where does that leave you? Mm-hmm. So you marry 20 years later, you're very much a different person. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think some of the... Um, benefits of being a two-time divorced woman is at 51 the relationship I'm in now I kind of feel it's a you have a a better shot yeah (laughs) a longer if that's the goal I don't even know that's the goal but we have a better shot of understanding each other and giving each other the space yeah Yeah. I like understanding yeah yeah me too yeah because it's like we both want to understand each other rather than it just be one person is the show and everyone has to understand me (laughs) it is so true it's the understanding of each other and really that's the goal you know to have a a deeper understanding about someone else the people in in your life that you care about a deeper understanding about yourself and then a deeper understanding about humanity Mm -hmm. do you think people lack learning how to build like meaningful relationships not even just in a um romantic way but just period friendships well you know I see some I have some of my best I've seen some great female relationships Mm -hmm. in my experience I went to Spelman College so that is like the that's huge it's the soil of black female relationships yeah (laughs) it's like fertile for that so you know a lot of people talk about the difficulties they have with relationships with other women I just don't have them. The majority of my relationships <clears throat> are with women. Mm-hmm. They're with black women and they're phenomenal relationships. Yeah. Someone asked me the other day, give me your, your, you know, your, your core group of people. My list was like 30. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, no, no, your core group. Like, who You're you like, know? no, this is it. I was like, this is, this is really, and like 24 of them are from Spelman. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I really, and you know, 24 of them are black women, but my core group is so strong. Um, I think that we have to, how do we, how do we develop good relationships? I think that we have to be in an environment like an HBCU. Sometimes people get that um, at church. Sometimes people get it at an HBCU. Sometimes people get that, um, you know, in a sorority or fraternity, but you have to be in a, in a fertile ground that is trying to nurture intimacy. Yeah. Um, you don't always learn that at home yeah and what's the what is the the um that outcome of having those great relationships everything depends on relationship so my parenting is supplemented by my group of aunties yeah um my business decisions are sharpened by the women and a couple of men that i rely on for suggestions and wisdom my confidence Mm -hmm. I'm like feeling you know beat down or nervous about a a meeting all I got to do is hang out with my (laughs) girls down the block Sonia will get me she's like my hype man they get you hype (laughs) 
They'll have you feeling like you're the baddest bitch out here. Like, I'm cold. You and that's, you know, you need that. You need a Sonia. You do. <laughs> um, so, yeah, everything from, like, from, from family to business to personal. I think that the, the intimacy of one, two, or 30 relationships, yeah. when used right, you know, it makes life better. Because I think sometimes we want our relationships there were times when I wanted my relationships to um, maybe fix a problem. Mm. You know, that, 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 those moments you're like, oh my God, no one's going to save me. I'm here in this world by myself. Yeah. I don't have, the, like, I'm just, no one, there is no savior. And you get a little anxious around that. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not going to be my man. It's not going to be my mm-hmm. girlfriend. It's not going to be my mom. Nobody can save me. And that is a real feeling. And it's really scary. It is. You know, because there's so much we have coming at us but if you think of your your core relationships as like um additional brain power to help you close the gap you don't need them to be just like you you don't need them to have the same opinion you don't even need them you don't even need to be around them all the time like there's some friends I just don't see for a while because I'm not vibing what they're up, up to you yeah. know, like the, the, the granular parts of their lives. I'm not feeling it right now. Yeah. But so it's not about like besties where you go out all the time, all, you know, and you're always hanging out. I it's love that me. you say that though. Cause I'm, yeah. I'm so not like a, um, you know, people are like, well, who's your best friend? And I'm like, I have, I have great friends. I have, you know, different friends and, you know, but I don't, I feel like the word to say my best friend is is a little immature I don't know but for me I just feel like I'm not in third grade like you know I have great relationships that I can call on people for certain things or vice versa absolutely I my my closest friends I don't see them you know there's there's a lot that plays into how often you see your friends as an adult like proximity scheduling do you have kids or not? Do you understand? Like, I can't leave my kids at six o'clock at night. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like when, when they're home. But so there's a lot, a lot that goes into this. But when I'm talking about like your core group, I, I mean, it's more like brain power and heart energy. Mm-hmm. Um, they might not be the ones that you see all the time, but you can call upon them to figure, to puzzle out some answers you know, to lift up your spirits, um, you know, like a substantial way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Quality. It's, um, <laughs> and, you, and, and we can walk away from these, these core people, not walk away, but we can spend time away from these core mm-hmm. people as well. Sometimes, you know, my besties, if you want to call them that my core group, they get on my nerves. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to talk to you today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure they feel the same because we're all older folks at this point. We have our opinions, like you said, <laughs> um, but those singular opinions aren't the point the point is collective brain power mm. yeah. yeah I like that I like that so if you had to put into words you know because you're it just sounds like you're always looking for your journey and um, enhancing your experiences so for you how do you feel <clears throat> you know discovering your best self what does that look like you know, I still can't get past um, love relationships. Those are the things that, you know, I probably judge myself the, the most on. What are my relationships like with my kids? Mm-hmm. What are my relationships like with my lovers, my boyfriend, current boyfriend or lovers, you know, in the, in the past? Mm-hmm. I always go back to that. And I think it's really because as humans, I think we just are co, <laughs> I call it, I call myself codependent, independent. Yeah. Well, because we do, we need the interaction, but then we get tired. <laughs> so like, I think I, I look at, I, I look at how I've grown through my relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as an example, I'll say this. So I have five kids. Two of them are now, you know, one is teen upper teen and the other one is in her lower twenties. Okay. So I've done, I've seen two kids go through the, I hate mom phase. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. Oh. First one breaks your heart, girl. I only have one. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have another one to replace it. 
Well, you'll have to borrow from me then. <laughs> because that first one, it, it's like a gut punch, right? You're just oh. like, they, you know, I don't, they don't like you. And yeah, you don't believe it to be biological, right? You feel personal about it. The second one for me, I was like, I can, I can crack this because I've seen it before, so I can crack it. It just got deeper. Like the second one really really did not like me yeah and so the third one now I'm I'm, I'm already I'm like okay so in about <laughs> 50 days babe you're gonna hate me I'm already be- beating you to that pit to that place you know I we know it's coming you're gonna hate me I'm giving you some grace yeah um you know I think it's like so I learned I, I look at how much I've learned with my kids I look at the pit and I measure that by patience by wisdom but then I also look at my growth in terms of like myself I mean I go so fast Mm -hmm. and that you know I try to think of myself more gently Mm -hmm. (laughs) treat myself more gently that to me is growth I like that yeah um and then you know when I see myself in the context of a larger world, like I was very comfortable being primarily grounded in the black community. Although I lived, you know, in a global world, my neighborhoods are often all white. My companies are usually white communities, but um, I was very grounded in the black community. Um, And when I realized that my son was transgender, that community did not necessarily have what I needed. Mm -hmm. and so I've gone outside of that community and I've gone I now am a part of the LGBTQAI plus community it Mm -hmm. is my community just as deeply as black folks are my community Mm -hmm. that to me is growth like if we can widen our friend groups Mm -hmm. but but people have to open up their perspective you gotta need something because you won't do it if you don't need it I didn't think I needed anybody really but black people yeah you know, and I'm, I'm like two seconds away from still believing that, but, 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 but my, but my, but my experience tells me that, um, when you need something that your community doesn't have, even if you love that community, it is your obligation to go outside and strengthen and get the knowledge, right. And then, and then be, become parts of other communities. This is how we end isms. Yeah. Understanding that the community over there is actually something it's a part of you as well. It's part of your need. Yeah. Um, so that to me is growth when you can see outside of your. Because we're multifaceted. We all need more than what than just this. Yeah. 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 And, and our children, you know, there are gaps in the language between adult and child. A lot of that gap is based on gender and identity and sexuality. They're seeing it differently. Then old, you know, young people talk about gender, race, sex identity differently than than adults do and I think as adults it's our obligation to learn new languages mm. Mm. That makes sense. for ourselves for the continuation of the species I mean yeah our world is pretty stuck right now as adults yeah to continue to want to to learn and grow yeah yeah you know like how you speak like verbally but also how you communicate with the world which is shifting and like it's going to be hard for adults to move to to change we don't do adults don't do change well Mm -hmm. but we have to yeah you know we are going to have to get this thing right otherwise we'll lose the interest of our own children yes and I think our children teach us if it's like screaming in our face (laughs) yeah yeah Mm -hmm. you know I think like I still don't have um all the respect of my kids they just you know it, it comes with it like kids don't see you mm-hmm. until maybe they get older my my 21 year old daughter said 22 year old daughter said to me she called me up one day she goes mama you know you are the most um mature responsible organized caring person I know and I was like what drug are you on <laughs> I'm coming to your college what what are you using you, yeah. you're on- she goes, mama, no, I'm just, I, I see you. <laughs> like, I, I, I wanted to just tell you, I'm, I'm, she's like, I'm sober. I don't do drugs, mama. I'm just calling you to tell you how much I love you and appreciate you. It was like such a turnaround from where yeah. she was, that I literally thought she was out of her mind. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> so like the young, our own children don't fully see us. And it is our job as the older folks to bridge that gap, to close that gap. And so I really speak to other adults, other cisgender, heteronormative, black women um, coming from families similar to mine where there's a tradition of male and female. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I try to speak to us and say like, I know it doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. I know we don't understand it, but this is a reality and let's try to be more flexible. Mm. Let's try. Yeah. Because it is our job as older folks yeah. to allow the younger people mm -hmm space to recreate the world yeah i mean we don't want the same world we, like who wants this world right now yeah <laughs> exactly. they're the ones who are gonna take over and be recreating as well i hope they re i hope they take it into the next the next level because i think we've tried to put a lot of old ideas on the new minds i hope they say no thank you as they are no thank you to bigotry no thank you to sexism no thank you to transphobia and i hope they take us someplace new where there is more collaboration mm -hmm. instead of domination. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Man, this was great. Yeah. <laughs> this oh was really God. good. I and I, I know it goes by so fast. It's like you can stay here, like, I need to get a cocktail and have another. Uh... <laughs> no, no, no. I'm doing like lemon and, and water. <laughs> don't, don't drink yet. Don't drink it. No, I'm saying like we could go on and keep talking. <laughs> true, true, true. But no, this was great. I mean, um, I would love to bring you back again. Um, and so uh, how can people find you? How can they find your book? So I have two books that um, I wrote. One is called um, The Bold World. And that is my memoir of The Bold World, um, a story of family and transformation. And then there's... Um, the true story of a boy named Penel Penelope. Born ready, the true story of a boy named Penelope. That's a children's book. Okay. So I would just appreciate if you if you buy the book. Yes. Uh, and get to know us that way. I think it's important to see Black families that are also queer, also transgender, and solid in their Blackness and solid in their familyness. Mm -hmm. So our books are great places to start. And then um, I'm on Instagram with my name, Jody Patterson. Almost all of my, I'm pretty... I'm pretty visible on Instagram, <laughs> not so much in other places, but that's the one place I feel really comfortable sharing. So. Yeah, I like Instagram too. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you all don't forget to check out uh, Discover Your Best Self. You can find us on Instagram and any of your podcast uh, platforms. And like Jody Patterson said, you can find her on Instagram as well. And don't forget to purchase her book, uh, Born Ready. Mm -hmm. and, Born Ready and The Bold World. The Bold World. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Thank you for listening to Discover Your Best Self. Don't forget to subscribe and comment. Follow us on Instagram at Discover Your Best Self.